and let the SkyMaster Russian Su-30 begin. All right, we unboxed this aircraft about a month ago, I think, just going from memory, and what a beauty. This is a phenomenal aircraft, museum piece. The, the, every last bit of it's amazing. Uh, at the end of the video, there is a link to the unboxing. If you haven't seen it, it is outstanding. So we are starting off with the SkyMaster Su-30, like our typical first videos of each build series. Let's take a look at the beautiful equipment going in this beautiful aircraft. All right, so here's a quick overview of all the equipment. We'll take a look at each piece individually, but uh, we got some fun stuff going in this, uh, this aircraft. All right, so pretty standard fare for most of the aircraft that we build here. This is kind of the normal combination of parts that we include uh, in our builds or like to use in our builds because they are amazing quality. So the aircraft will be piloted with a Jetty DS24 radio. That's kind of the norm here at the shop. We've got two different uh, layouts here and this is gonna be kind of an inter interesting plane with the, with the way things are laid out. So if you're a Jetty user or a Jetty fan, uh, this is gonna be kind of cool. So we have two different central boxes here. We have a central box 320, which is gonna be our primary. This is going in the front part of the aircraft. And then we've got a central box 210. Now the central box 210 is gonna live in the rear part of the aircraft, but these will be connected together. And because there's so much in the back end of the aircraft, there's your vectored thrust nozzles, your vertical stabs, your horizontal stabs. That's why we're putting a 210 in the back portion of the aircraft. So pretty, uh, pretty cool layout on this thing. So that's the control hubs of the aircraft. We've got two Rex 7 40 centimeter dipole antenna receivers, a norm for the way we do things. So we're gonna have one as our primary, the second one is gonna be our clone setup. And of course we have a Cortex Demon Pro gyro also being used in the aircraft. We've got a Jetty R3, which is gonna be used for our remote on and off for the aircraft. And our air system is going to be controlled by a Zykoi fail safe sequencer. That's gonna do the gear and doors of the aircraft, as well as the Zykoi air valves are gonna control the brake and the gears and doors opening and closing. We are also installing a V-Speak compressor. This is an onboard compressor. If you guys are a fan of the channel, you should be very familiar with these compressors. They pretty much go in any air system installation that we're doing now, except the really small stuff. But the V-Speak's awesome. It really jives with the Jetty system very well, along with other radio systems. But it's great insurance, and it just makes sure that you have always got air on board. Uh, also has telemetry built in as well so this is also going in the aircraft and then we've got our MKS servo bundles here now there's a bit of a mix here with servos so we've got uh, two 9930s I forget what the layout is on these things but we've got two 9930s we've got four of the brushless 599 servos I believe these are going in the flaps and the vertical stabs we've got three uh, HBL 388s. Now these two of them are going in the horizontal stabs or the elevators of the aircraft and one is going in the nose or the steering of the aircraft. Now it's a big servo for this but that's because there's so much weight on the nose that you need a very robust servo for this application. We've got our very serious MKS arms. The chutes for this aircraft it will have twin chutes and these chutes are made by RC Jet Chutes. Paul makes these up and they are a thing of beauty. Uh, these in particular are gorgeous, gorgeous chutes. So looking forward to seeing the Maiden on this aircraft. I know we're jumping ahead by months, but looking forward to seeing the Maiden of this aircraft and these beautiful chutes being used. So we've also got Zykoi 235s that are also gonna be powering the aircraft. Those aren't here yet, but uh, when we do have them show up during the build process, we will discuss and show those engines as well. Uh, we will be doing a test on those engines because it's a brand new engine that's come out and I'm excited to see it for the first time. Uh, the vectored thrust nozzles that came with the kit, 
Uh, when, you, when you get them uh, operational, they come with 599SL servos. So the 599s are just like the regular brushless 599s, except half the, the height, which is nice for the, uh, the tail cones because they're pretty tight and limited in room. So that is the equipment that's going in this amazing aircraft. All right, so we printed the manual off. Generally, the Skymaster manuals are terrible, uh, but because this is a fairly new plane, it actually looks better than most. Uh, I also have my servo layout here done. And uh, so this is what we're doing. 388s in the elevators, 599s in the rudders, 599s in the ailerons. The 9930s are for the slats and the I call this one a 388, but it's actually a 3850. So we've got two of the 388s and we've got one of the 3850. The 3850 is for the nose. All right, so first step here at the shop when we start a new build is we like to lay everything out like I've already showed you guys. We've got the plane sitting on the stand. We've got uh, the parts sitting over there because we're using our little studio here. We've got our supplies over there, but the first step now moving forward is we, number one, need to update all of our Jetty products. That's pretty typical when you're starting a new build and you're using Jetty, make sure you update your Jetty stuff. And number two, we wanna get our servos starting to burn in. Now, very common question that I've been asked many times, why do I do the servo burn-in process? Well, the point is, Typically, if an electronic device is going to fail, it usually fails in its, its beginning part of its lifespan. So a uh, perfect example is the BVM plane that we just finished. The Venom Scheme F-16 that's over there. That plane had a faulty air valve, a solenoid, so it went bad probably after 20 minutes of being on in the aircraft, having it powered up. It didn't really cycle a whole bunch, but it was on for about 20 minutes total. We did a couple cycles on it with the brakes and it just stopped working. So that's why we burn in the servos. Uh, it doesn't cause any undue wear on them at all. The, the goal is basically if, if something's gonna fail on it, I want it to fail during that burn in process, hopefully. It's not a very common thing to have an issue, but I have had an issue over the past two years during my builds with servos. Now. MKS servos, I've never had one go bad during the burn-in process. Another manufacturer that I used to deal with on a very regular basis uh, that I don't generally deal with anymore, their servos uh, in one batch of 13 that I was putting on a plane, I had to fail during that burn-in process. So it happens. Okay, so here's the process that we use for doing our servo cycling is, is a better word, not a burn-in process, but that's just my simple slang terminology. So what I'll do is we use a jetty box for this. Uh, the jetty box is awesome. It's very versatile when it comes to doing lots of stuff with aircraft, but, uh, and various parts and things works great with the jetty system. But in a situation like this, we also use the servo cycler function. So we plug our servo in the, the device port, plug our power in the power port, and we get our screen coming on here. So basically what it uh, says is impulse generator, no uh, servo cycler. Yes, the impulse generator, we can pick a uh, location for the servo. And uh, so number of cycles is the first thing that pops up. I'm gonna increase that to 990. That's the max the device goes to and that's just what I do every servo at. Uh, so it starts, uh, it always defaults to 300 and a speed of 10. So when I'm doing the sequence like this, when it's done this servo, I can unplug it and start it right away and it saves all the changes that I'm gonna make right now. But if the power is removed and you start back over again, this is what it comes to. So I increase the uh, distance it's traveled to 500. So now it's traveling its full motion. And I increase the speed using the right arrow up to 30. So that's my standard settings that I used or always use. And you can see the servo is moving back and forth. So this takes about 20 minutes per servo. So I just have this set aside, let it do its thing. When this is done doing its cycle, I always flip the servo over, put a check mark on it, set it aside and move on to the next one. All right, so our servos are just buzzing away there, doing their thing, uh, running themselves in. We're on servo number four. And just doing some organizing here and some layouts and stuff. So we've talked about our servos. Here's a layout for the CB210. 
So throughout the build, we'll get into more in-depth stuff regarding this, but just to give you kind of a brief rundown here. So the Jetty uh, 320 central box is going to be in the front part of the aircraft. And we've got the two dots there. I've just marked them so they're nice and clear. So that is E1 and E2. There's gonna be a line going back to the back part of the plane and that is going to plug in to the central box 210. So the 210, it's gonna plug into R1 and R2. So, and then on the central box 210, I'll throw a screenshot up here of everything that's gonna be run into that central box 210. So this is definitely an important part of the back part of the aircraft, powers a lot of stuff in the back end, and then everything else in the front part of the aircraft is taken care of by the, ooh, uh, the 320. So that's how things are laid out. Uh, the owner is going to send me the JSN file, the, the model file, uh, later tonight, and we'll be able to put that in the radio and start kind of getting things organized. Now, the manual itself, it starts off with, come on, it starts off with the wings. Now, Generally, I kind of start at the back part of the aircraft and work my way forward, that's fine. I'm probably gonna just do the manual process in this case uh, because it's a new aircraft for me. But uh, one thing we're gonna start before we even do any of this stuff is the landing gear. So landing gear arrived in raw aluminum, silver finish, and that needs to be painted. So we need to take all the landing gear out, and this would be a normal process for us anyways, because we wanna make sure we lock tight everything on the landing gear. So um, the access point there, I believe the landing gear itself mounts to those little uh, parts that are bolted into the fuselage there. And I believe when we undo those, the nose gear should pop out. Now the mains themselves, those will be a little bit more simple because we just need to take the legs out. The front is gonna be definitely more complicated. So one of the downsides when you're working on an aircraft this big is purely access to stuff. This aircraft gets to the point where it's so big that you can't just move it around by yourself, flip it upside down, put it on a hood stand. Uh, you need to be a, quite mindful of, of how you're organizing things and how you're uh, maneuvering this thing around. So the SU itself, it doesn't have a whole lot of support. So this is kind of the easiest way to work on it. And we need to be a little bit careful with the intake ducts there. So the intake ducts, um, they're just all molded. There's, there's really no structure in the intake ducts, but there's lots of structure in the back portion of this aircraft. So from here to the back. So this can support a decent amount in the back end of the aircraft, but the intakes can't. So with this plane being empty right now, totally fine with the way it's sitting, but as we start to add things to the aircraft, we need to be mindful of that and we will be doing something with the uh, supporting the front end. So, but for now, first step is we are going to pull that landing gear out and get access to it. I believe we need to pull the cockpit out as a first step as well. We will need to do that anyways because we need access to the front end. So step one, let's pull the cockpit out. So we got the cockpit out of the aircraft. Now this is easily the nicest Skymaster cockpit I've ever seen. Uh, it's totally different than the normal design. We've got uh, all these different pieces of plywood all glued together very nicely. The mounting system is awesome with the, uh, the bolt system here, which is really nice. And you can see there, we've got the mounting system for the back portion. And this is the mid uh, instrument cluster. So a really nice cockpit design that is very nice. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to separate the nose section again, and that's gonna allow us better access to that nose gear. So the fuselage splits right here, and you can see once we split it, the nose gear is much more accessible. And that's also, I think, where our equipment tray goes as well as in that area. So we gotta play around with that stuff. 
So I took the shop back and vacuumed out the back end here. There's a little bit of uh, like overspray paint dust and stuff in the whole back end. So I've cleaned out the, uh, the entire uh, whole section from front to back on both, uh, both sides. Um, I do like the access here with this uh, front end off. So we've got great access to the nose gear. So we'll pull the, uh, all the fasteners here out. It's just a whole bunch of Allen key bolts get those taken out. And while we're here, we're also gonna take the main tanks out as well. So we'll take the, uh, the two front tanks out and we'll also take out the back tank as well once we get these guys out. All right, tanks are out, really nice setup actually. So you got good access to the front fasteners here. Uh, the back is actually tabbed. So initially I, I ran through the uh, gear door openings, which you actually have really good access to anyways. So you can get those, uh, gear fasteners right there. But this piece here gets fastened in place and then the other pieces are tabbed in there. So the reason for that is your back tank needs to come out through this opening right here. So this piece needs to be removable. I just think it's a really nice design, really well thought out. All right, and we're gonna try something new here with YouTube. So uh, one of the things that YouTube recently offered like just this week was you can upload a video and have it available to channel members before the scheduled release date. So as an example, I uploaded tomorrow's video, which is one of the F16 videos, uh, two days ago to YouTube. And if you're a channel member, you are able to watch that video as soon as it's uploaded. You don't have to wait to the release date. So I thought uh, that would be a cool way to offer channel memberships. And that's what we've done. So I'm not sure where the link is or what it is, but I'll, I'll put it in the video description down below and I'll also put it in the first comment. Uh, if you do subscribe to be a channel member, uh, you have to pay for it. Now, you gotta remember that sometimes I upload videos weeks in advance. So right now I've got about uh, four videos in the queue that have already been filmed that can be uploaded to YouTube. So you could get videos weeks in advance. So anyways, if you're interested, check it out. Of course it is paid, uh, a paid service, but I'll put the links down below or also in the first description of the comment section. All right, so if you watch the unboxing, you know that I was oh so excited about these included aluminum fittings with this SkyMaster kit. Well, I got too excited for no reason. So this is all six millimeter Festo tubing size, which is not good. So we wanna be using eight mil on everything. So even the little vent fittings here are also six millimeter. Uh, eight millimeter fits over there, but it's very loose and even the tie wire isn't safe. So um, I'm gonna be ordering new vent fittings and new tank fittings, and we'll be doing high flow on all of these tanks. So I was gonna get the tanks ready, but we'll set those tanks aside for now. And we did get the front gear out, very simple. Undo all the bolts and you do have to cut the airline. So there's the red airline there, the blue airline there. And uh, obviously the gear comes out very easy actually. It's, it's quite nice. So now we're gonna get the main gear out of the fuselage. All right, so pulling the main gear out is fairly straightforward, all things considering. So we've got it raised up here. The gear itself is quite simple. So you have just a straight leg that comes down on its pivot there, and you've got your air cylinder actuating the leg. So what we'll do is we'll just disconnect the air cylinder from the leg, and then the, uh, the leg itself is bolted into the fuselage with four bolts to blind nuts. So we'll just undo that, and it should be fairly simple. Four screws that come up through the, I guess the underside are reasonably okay. And then there's also two screws on the inside uh, facing the mid, mid line of the aircraft. So those are, uh, they're all fairly decent to access. So, all right, so disassembling the main gear first because I just don't feel like getting into the, uh, the nose gear yet because uh, it's a heck of a lot more complicated. So we uh, took the, uh, the wheel off, uh, paying close attention to the orientation of the brake uh, system here. This is quite important. So I just took them off, stuck them down, obviously took pictures. Uh, but if you're interested in seeing how the air system 
for SkyMaster works, I figured I would show you how it works. So you basically have, um, to this particular wheel, there's three separate parts. So you've got your outer inner rim, and then there's this inner liner here. So both of the outer pieces, they make a joint together right there with the O-ring. So those pieces seal up together. And then this outer piece here squishes between the tires. So the tire inside wall here gets squished between this and the outer rim, creating an enclosed area inside the wheel. And then what happens is as you pump air into the uh, air fitting there, the air goes in between the wheel and this liner piece and the O-ring seals off that hole right there. So the air goes in, O-ring seals it closed and the air is trapped inside the tire. Now I'm handling this carefully because there's silicone lube all over this and I don't want to get, uh, get it contaminated. So I'm just being careful with it. So, so We've uh, got the mains done here as far as we need to go. So what we'll do is, well, we'll set this aside and now we'll take off the front wheels. All right, so last thing we're doing tonight is we are going to get our wheels painted. So everything's been prepped off for paint. We've cleaned each of the wheels, uh, prepped off the airline, uh, made a bunch of covers out of some thin foam, as you can see, covered up the inside and let's get painting. So for painting, we're gonna use some self-etching primer. And fortunately this is green, so this actually might be the color that we leave it. Uh, we'll have to see what it turns out like. Uh, some of the pictures I've looked at are this color green, some of them are bright green, so obviously probably it doesn't really have a standard color. But uh, we'll paint the primer on there, see how it looks, and go from there. All right, so we have put the final color coat on the wheels and rims and all that stuff. So this is the primer color. I decided to go with the actual green that I got for this scenario. So um, I think it's a better match to the pictures that I've looked at and it's a little bit more obviously bright and obvious. So we've got that done. Those are all complete now and we're gonna let them dry here and we'll put that stuff back together. Now the only other thing, this is the color that we used here. The only other thing we need to paint is the uh, back part of the, the brake assembly here. So uh, these are 3D printed from SkyMaster. So, all right, so we've gone through and painted all of our scale details. So painted the brake assemblies, did a little bit of uh, dry brushing and, and fun stuff on the silver bits there. Uh, just kind of made that up. I think it looks good. And we've gone through on the nose gear and painted all of our scale bits that were black before and we painted them all silver. So that is the, uh, the light housing, the uh, steering system, this piece here, the other light housings, all silver. So before we even think about putting this gear back in the aircraft, it's Loctite time. So as Trusty always says, make sure you Loctite your gear. If you do not, you will be sorry later. Now there's a couple critical items on the SkyMaster setup here. So one of the uh, primary things is these direct steering assemblies. We need to take this off and confirm that we've got a flat spot on this shaft that comes all the way down to our arm that controls our steering. There's a lot of force on this shaft. So you wanna make sure that you've got a nice flat spot there. So we'll pop that off and get that taken care of. The other thing to consider here is our steering servo is an eight millimeter shaft and the stock setup here is a uh, six millimeter shaft or a smaller normal size shaft. So we've got to figure out a system to get our servo mounted to this as well. All right guys, and you know, I think this is actually totally perfect and designed for this. This is incredible. So. Here is the, uh, the steering servo. We've got a 3850. Uh, these guys use the eight millimeter shaft. So they're an oversized shaft and they're designed for, um, well, one of the styles is this one right here. So one of the things we need to consider is how do we get this servo arm 
mounted on that shaft. Well, the spacing between center to center on this, the stock setup and the center to center on that is, it looks to be exactly the same. So like 15.78 millimeters. Now, the only issue is when we, these two pieces need to mate together. So basically this needs to mate to that. So we'll probably have to use a little bit longer uh, fitting screws and stuff, but I think we'll be able to make that work perfectly. All right, so the perfect spacer here is, this is one of the aluminum servo arms that I had cut down previously and there was just a small little nub on there. So I've sanded that down and this now is the perfect spacer. And what we need to do is we need to bolt the receiver hub here, this piece, onto our steering servo. So that I think is going to work out good. The only issue we're going to have here is our spacing between the uh, the shaft and the servo. It may work out good. I don't know yet, but we need to do this and then we'll worry about this next. So what we need to do in order to get this set up is we need to now put the program onto my radio so we can do our setup on all of our servos. The owner has sent me the program for the previous SU, so let's get that installed on the Jetty radio. Okay, so here is our function layout, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, the receiver outputs aren't really totally true because we've got, remember, two central boxes, but just show you guys here as we go down the list. Uh, so the first 12 channels are going to be more or less associated with the central box 200 series that's going in the back. And then we've got from 13 to 24, pretty much everything that's going in the front of the aircraft. So, but these can be allocated to any output on the various systems in the aircraft. So if you're familiar with Jetty, this is gonna be normal to you, but uh, for anybody new or maybe looking at Jetty, this is uh, maybe a bit more detail um, for you. So something like port number one here on the center box 320, this is not automatically your elevator output. This is whatever you want it to be. So uh, we're gonna program our central box to match up to all these guys, which is fine, but then our front central box can be whatever we need it to be. So uh, as an example, channels 13 can start off with number one, number five, wherever we want it to go. So it doesn't really matter. Okay, so now that we wanna start setting up servos, I'm going to pair our primary receiver with the radio system, and that will allow us to start doing our servo setup. So quite simple with this, and I'm just gonna mark this with a P so we know it's our primary receiver. All right, so I'm just kind of playing around with all the existing programming here, and we are gonna simplify things a little bit. I'm gonna try and be very detailed on this installation so you guys uh, are aware of what's going on here. So two elevators, which is fine, two ailerons, which is fine. Uh, we've got a rudder, a rudder. So we've got one rudder system, but two, two channels, obviously two servo assignments. Um, the pitch and yaw is for the tail. We've got a shoot cap here, a shoot release, and also a shoot function. So all of that can be simplified with the new system because the Gen 2 of this aircraft comes with the JP electric setup. So the chute mechanism is all electric. There's a controller for this. So that's gonna make the chute system very simple. We're also not doing a release. We, we've started doing fishing line with the, uh, the chutes. So hopefully that fishing line gives way if the, if the chutes are ever to release when you don't want them to. So that simplifies a lot of this stuff going on right here. Now, the other thing that I noticed is we've got uh, the gear is also sequenced through the radio system. And because we use the Zykoi failsafe slash sequencer, this is now a simple solution where we just have a gear channel. So that's pretty advantageous to simplify all of our uh, programming here. So I'm gonna go in and make some changes to the programming. So we're just gonna get rid of the doors as an example. We can get rid of a bunch of the uh, sequences and logical programming because of the simplification of what's going on here.
All right, so we paired our receiver here. First thing we have to do is we have to go in and change our E1 output to EX bus. Now, um, that's the only thing we're gonna do right now, just so we can get this running through our central boxes. So we've done that. And now we can plug this into the central box and we should be able to see this and also see the central box. All right, so this gives everybody an idea here of what our power distribution system will be in this aircraft. Now, this central box, as we've talked about, is going in the back portion of the aircraft. We'll have another power supply uh, feeding from these guys to this one. So basically what we've got here is we've got all of our signal coming out right now through E1 and it's going into the R1 port on the other central box. When we look at our radio, we've got our Rec7, we've got our CB320, and we've also got our central box 210. So we can go in there and we can mess around with the central box 210, and that is really darn cool. So now what we can do with our systems all uh, connected here is we can go in and program our central box 210 to have our layouts as designated right here. So elevator right, rudder right, uh, these are the different ports that are going to relate to this central box. And all of that is done through the Jetty radio system. Okay, so we've gone through and we've set up all of our outputs on the central box 210. The other thing we've done is if you look here, you'll see that output 14 and 15 are blank. And the reason for that is we have gone and we have set up those as not servo outputs. They've been switched to telemetry inputs. It's one of the benefits of these ports here, 14 and 15. So now our Zykoi uh, telemetry modules from the turbines will plug into those ports there. So we've got our uh, 3850 adapted here to our setup. This worked out really well. I needed to supply longer uh, 1.5 millimeter or two millimeter uh, Allen bolts here, but they are perfectly sized and that is ready to go. So uh, we've got the, the output shaft is flat spotted very nicely by SkyMaster, that's good. So we don't want to install that yet. And the reason we don't want to install that yet is we have to go through and do our lock tighting on our gear. That's very important. Remember this, every bolt, every fastener on the entire gear system needs to be Loctited. Now, one of the ones that I'm concerned about here that we need to get access to is going to be this little guy right down here. So we're gonna pull this pin out that's gonna separate this lower portion and give us access to the two screws that are holding this back one in place. All those things matter. And if you don't do this now, you will be doing it later on when you don't want to do it at the field. So simply gonna go over all the bolts right now and make sure they are all Loctited. All right, some important details on these gear. So this is the, uh, the shaft or the air cylinder that actuates the landing gear itself. So we undid these top bolts because we have to Loctite them. And there's a set screw holding in this pin here. So you wanna make sure you take pins like this out and flat spot them. If you don't flat spot them, that set screw will come loose as well. So we did the one down here. Uh, so those are important ones to make sure that you, you get a flat spot on. Another example here, our last uh, ones that we have to do are the main uh, pivots here for the gear coming up and down. So again, these ones are not flat spotted. So you don't have to do much, just a tiny little flat spot there. And before you take these pins out, if you tighten that screw down a little bit, it actually makes a little mark on the pin and makes finding that and adding the flat spot very simple. All right, so we are ready to put this back together. We've got everything Loctited. Now, uh, there is a set screw that's supposed to go in there. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch that out to a Allen key bolt. So this is gonna be a lot more, stronger, and this is kind of the last thing to make this a, an absolutely rock solid nose steering system. So there's lots of clearance in this whole area. Uh, there's gonna be no interference, but uh, you're able to get more torque on this thing and uh, better than a, a little set screw that fits inside there. The other problem with the set screw is because we're only dealing with half a shaft, 
what happens is your flat spot to your shaft is right about here. So you've got that set screw coming in about halfway into that hole. So it's only holding on by maybe two to three threads versus if we change it to a bolt like this, the bolt is now holding on all those threads on this stainless steel part. All right, so now that our uh, painted wheels have had enough time to dry, we're gonna reassemble the wheels and put them on the finished landing gear. Front first, still need to lock tight the back and go through them. All right, so I've just pulled all the prep off the mains here, just to give you an idea what it looks like and the area that we actually prepped off. So obviously we didn't paint the areas that were, are not gonna be visible during the, uh, the aircraft being, I guess in its normal flying state. So I think also on the, the camera, whether it's my iPhone or even this camera, the green shows up on the screen here a lot brighter than it actually is. Like this is like, army drab kind of color. And I think on the screen, it's much brighter. So keep that in mind, uh, but we're gonna get those assembled. They, they're pretty simple to put them back together as well. So when we do put these back together, obviously we're Loctiting all the bolts, but we're gonna go in here and we're also gonna pull these guys out and put Loctite on them as well. These are just the ones that hold the brake system in place. So it's important to do those ones too. All right, so front and mains are back assembled, ready to go. So the mains are pretty straightforward. Uh, there's only a couple areas to deal with here and we added flat spots to these pins down on the scissor linkage. The nose section here, I went one step further when I reinstalled the light and just put a piece of black shrink tube over top of the wire just because that portion is visible. So um, we'll zip tie that to the leg and now it's uh, just black instead of black and red. So these landing gear are now ready to install back in the plane. So we'll do the exact opposite of what we did. Uh, front gear is quite simple to install. Uh, mains, now that we know how they come in and out, they should be fairly straightforward as well. Uh, when I took these out, I did mark them just to make it simpler right and left on the top part. All right guys, and that is going to wrap up video number one in the SU-30 build series. Uh, I think we got a lot done in this video. Uh, next video, we're gonna start to work on some of the surfaces and, uh, and that's what we're after. So anyways, don't forget to check out the lighter side of RC after dark. Uh, we do a lot of live streams here from the shop. Well, once every two weeks ish for about two hours ish, usually on Saturdays. And uh, the nice thing about the lighter side of RC after dark is you get to see in real time what goes on behind the scenes and also reach out to us and, and have a conversation back and forth through the chat. So it's always a fun time. We usually have some fun guests here and uh, it's a grand old time for about two hours on a Saturday night. Uh, also, don't forget about the channel memberships. I'll put some information down below. Uh, right now, we're about two weeks ahead-ish on videos. So if you do get a channel membership, you'll get to see all those videos well before ever anybody else sees them. So thanks guys for watching and we will see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.